Captain Judy Helmy has been a successful charter boat captain for over 50 years. She took over her father's business and its new name became Miss Judy Charters in the middle 60s. Her father, Captain Sherman Helmy, started his fishing charter business in 1948. It was considered one of the first deep sea fishing charter services in Savannah, Georgia. Captain Judy is a self-taught, accomplished author and columnist for many monthly and weekly publications. For over 25 years, Captain Judy has provided the Southeast with current weekly fishing conditions. She is also known for, by many for her publications of numerous popular fishing stories, many of which we'll hear today, I hope. All articles are based on actual accounts of her fishing experience, which in her case has been thousands. She did say earlier, though, that you have to kind of guess the lies associated with it. <laughs> Captain Judy's most favorite published stories are Little Miss Judy's Believe It or Not. These stories are of her unbelievable childhood, while others are based on her father's long-run working relationship with Big Al Capone. Sorry, little Big Al Capone. <laughs> Captain Judy's father has been inducted in the American Prohibition Museum City Market and she is currently awaiting the grand opening. Captain Judy's first book, My Father, the Sea, and Me, was published in 1992. This book shared her father's younger years as well as some of her exciting fishing experiences with her unforgettable customers. Captain Judy published in 2009 three two how-to how booklets, Spotted Sea Trout Booklet, Spinner Shark Fishing Booklet, and Trophy Redfish Booklet, I think I need to read all three, um, which are all packed full of great color pictures showing fishermen how they can catch, how they get the, the job done catching fish. She is currently working on her complete life story, which will also include stories prior to her birth, which she calls the Big Al Capone era. Her, st her stories have proven so interesting, funny, and entertaining that she has been asked over the years to be a guest speaker at many different organizations. The highlight, I'm sure, is being at the Red Club of Savannah. Oh, yeah. She hosts fishing schools, and they have been attended by many. Her company has hosted three generations of customers. With her new regime of professional captains, she hopes to serve the fourth and fifth fishing generations of fishing enthusiasts. Miss Judy Charters has a total of 10 charter boats, which can accommodate both inshore and offshore fishing. All trips can be customized to fit the smallest group to the largest corporate fishing needs. Captain Judy has been, every day is a gift, at, well, I shouldn't say this, but I guess she put it in there. Um, <laughs> now that she is 65, she realized that every fishing day is a gift, and it's true, she's been kicking fish tail since 1956. Please welcome Captain Judy. Thank you very much. If I hadn't known you were going to read that, I would shorten it up. So. <laughs> um, thank you very much for having me here. Um, and I hope y'all want to go fishing and call us and charter some of our boats because we would really appreciate it. And I have to say one thing. Uh, Jerry Lee Lewis was married six times, correct? My father was married eight times. <laughs> <laughs> alimony too for 45 years <coughs> and, this, and we quit playing alimony to the first marriage when we found out that we could go to court and stop it and they said if he didn't pay the alimony they were going to put him in jail I agreed they should put him in jail <laughs> the second marriage was my mother the third marriage he married the same lady twice and on the first one let's be the third and the fourth and let's see the fifth some of them we had a no because he was a little crazy after the fifth and sixth. <laughs> so I had so many stepmothers, I'm not even sure, to be honest. But um, I've got some pictures up here that I want to show y'all, and I'm going to try to tell a story about each picture, and you'll have to tell me when to shut up, okay? All right, this is my boat. Uh, I had this boat built in 90, 1994. I've had it done over four, four or five times. It's had four engines on it, but believe me, it's it's a fish catching machine. So uh, it would carry up to six up to six people and up to ten people on it. Okay. This is these are pictures from my father's 
many businesses that he ran starting in the 30s. Uh, he, it is true, my father did, did work for Al Capone, and I did, let me see if I get this right. I used to say he allegedly worked for Al Capone, but he actually did, and it's been proven that he worked and did a lot more stuff than I thought about. <laughs> uh, these are just some of the pictures of some of the old pictures at his many businesses. He had a business across the street or across from Bradley Lock and Key. Um, and Mr. Bradley, my father, did something. Um, and $200,000 worth of counterfeit money was involved. <laughs> but the great grandson of Bradley Lock and Key said that didn't happen. But it, it really did. <laughs> um, because. I, you know, I remember all these stories that my father told him all the time. Anyway, this is some of the some of the pictures that I that he took. This is a picture that you would uh, that I took from the window of Green's a, a Green store, but it's actually a speakeasy that was on the back side of Wilmington Island. This is where they brought the liquor in. Um, if you stood and looked out the window, this is what you would see. And they brought the liquor in here, and my father had a trap door underneath the restaurant or the speakeasy where they pulled the bado in and unloaded. He also built the cars to put the liquor in to take them into town. He also had a wrecker to carry the cars with the liquor if they broke down. <laughs> these are just, I'm not sure these are some of the boats. These pictures are real old, but they did um, bring the boats in and from the ocean. And then my father put them in smaller boats and brought them into Kareem. Um, this picture is pretty interesting because as a child, when I used to go down to Greens, and what, what she's pointing at is there was a picture of a robust woman there, you know, big, big everything. And um, when the kids went in there, it had a, it, they always covered it. They didn't want the children to look at it. So we tried to steal it, but somebody already got it. Now, if you ever ride around, uh, say, in the creeks and rivers over at Little Tybee, and you see these pilings all, you know, just hanging around, pilings, some of them are rotten, posts and everything. My father built all of these places to put the liquor. So the bigger boats would bring them to the pilings and put them on the little platforms, and the smaller boats would kind of get the liquor off the platforms. Um, my father said there was so much stealing going on that he, don't know how, he doesn't know how anybody made any money. He drank a lot of it, too. <laughs> um, this is me holding an amberjack. This is uh, uh, everybody on this seat right here. Um, this is a barracuda. And this is another barracuda. And did y'all know? And everybody says, oh, my God, they smell terrible. You are absolutely correct. They do smell terrible. And I don't really want to eat them. But if you ever did want to eat them, and a lot of our customers do, people say, well, you know, they could have poison. I'm like, well, there's a way to decide. If you put the meat near an ant bed, the ants will run away from it. If you hold the liver of the barracuda and it tingles, um, that means it's got poison. I don't, that's why I suggest not eating them. Uh, I learned that a long time ago from some wise old man from uh, probably Cuba. Um, this birds. What they do is, uh, they land on our boats all the time, but when they get tired, they lay on the surface just like this, and they put their bill inside their feathers, and uh, they lay there, or something eventually eat them. I don't know what kind of birds they are. Uh, this is a long, a yellow bill, long, uh, what was it, Deidre? Long, tropical, tropical yeah, tropical yellow bill. <laughs> bird, and I figured out when I fished at the Gulf Stream that every large wahoo, a bird follows it, and that's how I ended up catching so many large wahoos. What they do is they follow and mimic the movement of the wahoo. So you can still use this to catch wahoo now. If you go offshore into the stream area and you see a bird like this following or acting strange in the air, he's following the wahoo because as soon as the wahoo eats and kills, Entrails, the entrails float up and they get to eat that. So this is why these birds all have something in common with the wahoo. We probably caught, I guess, literally hundreds of hundred pound wahoo using this theory. Don't shoot the bird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right, this is a black sea bass. Deidre's holding it. You see the hump? 
on that black sea bass up there behind his head. That's a stress hump from having to fertilize all the eggs that the females make. This fish is born a female, turns into a male, and can turn back if it wants to. Boy, we, we've seen a lot of that lately on the news. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, another male sea bass. And, and sometimes you get them, they have the humps, and, the, and then you'll figure out they're turning into females again. It's the strangest thing I've ever seen. That's another male sea bass. See, there's a lot more males than females now. Uh, these are just some customers that had a good time. Everybody's got a fish on them. I don't know if you can see that. But we were fishing for blackfish. Now, the top was a male and the bottom was a female. And I just wanted you to know that. And they can change because if there's too many females, they'll change it to a male. If there's too many males, it's, it's really unreal that they can do that. More customers, these are black sea bass. You can see the blue on the head. Those are all the males. Do y'all recognize anybody? Let me know. Uh, once again, black sea bass. Oh, okay. I, I forgot to tell you, and I didn't put it in my little speech. Right? We do burials at sea. And that, that, okay. That, okay. That's my bag that I designed because when my father, the first burial at sea we did was Mrs. Does anybody know the Delaney's? You do? Uh, well, maybe it wasn't the Delaney's. I don't know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so, okay. I didn't, I'm not going to say anything bad anyway. So the first time, I, they, my first time Fox and Wiggs brought over a body for us to bury, they came in a, in a casket. And my father said, this thing's not going to sink. And they said, well, this is what you got to bury them in. So, Daddy said, told me to go to the house and get the shotgun and some double off buck shells in the casket. Did not sink it till he shot it. Two K, I mean, he shot it until it sank. Well, I needed therapy when I saw that. <laughs> so when I got home and I decided to do this on my own, I, this is the bag I came up with. And that's a that's a canvas bag, and a lot of things come out of that canvas. I, I tried to get them to make it a color so I wouldn't see everything that was seeping through it. This, this is Mrs. Delaney. <laughs> this is the first body I ever did. We did Mr. Delaney, and then Mrs. Delaney called and wanted to go. Right. Hauser. <laughs> you see the seat belts? We put seat belts on her, and we didn't have enough fuel to go all the way to the stream. Oh my I tied weight on, weights on her legs, and we had some really big problems getting her out the boat. Things got really strange. Okay, that is the gas tank of a Harley Davidson. Just a gas tank. The lady who bought that, it was her father's ashes. And I said, her father said, I want to be buried on my Harley Davidson, and she said, no way. So she bought the gas tank with his ashes in it. And that's how they do that in the ocean. This bag, well, we didn't have time to build a bag. And this is one of them CSI bags. It busted. The head came out. My first mate fainted. And it was horrible. <laughs> so I'm, you know, we haven't done one in a long time. I'm, but I would like, so if anybody wants to do that, <laughs> I, I, really do want I want to do it again if I have to do it one more time. <laughs> one one guy one guy was pushed over and it might have been him. We I went to Champion Machine and I had shafts make. They said, "How do you want these shafts tapered?" I said, "I'm going to put them on a body to sink them. They dropped the shaft like I, like they'd already been on the body, so we had to duct tape the shafts to that one because we couldn't get the bag made right." Anyway, y'all call me if y'all want to do something. Would you add your <laughs> Okay, I'm going to change this. Uh -oh. Okay, this is just some more pictures from my father's shop. Uh, we're at Big O' Al Capone. Um, this is a cobia, which y'all know, cobia season has been closed. We won't be able to have any so far. I've counted 23 at my boat in the last couple of days. This is some of the cobia that's Ken Cannibal. Oh, 
Too bad you can't see this really good, but that's me, and that's Deidre's father, and those are the four Kobe I caught when I was, uh, let me go back. Uh, well, I'll leave it there. <coughs> The Kobe that I, you saw that was in the dock house before was me, and my father wouldn't help me, so I slid all over the boat, tore the whole pair, whole seat of my pants out. So, and Kobe fish has been very, very popular with us. My father, John Burke, took this picture, and that's a really big Kobe. And the story went that everybody fought it. My father, George Garman, Deidre's father. You know, it was so big, it weighed about 90 pounds. Come to find out, they shot it with a bow and arrow, it died, completely floated on top of the water, but John Burke said that wasn't a good story, so they made it up. <laughs> um, oh, let's see. My daddy's brother's child, y'all probably know Red's Helmy. Yeah, okay. You know, Red's Helmy, my cousin, I call him Uncle Bobby. He, he hijacked a plane to Cuba in 1960, and I know y'all remember that. Y'all are old enough. You, yeah, it was on the front news. How many surprised? Boy, were we surprised. <laughs> yeah, he, anyway, he hijacked a plane to Cuba, going to kill Castro, and he got there, and of course, they arrested him. <laughs> it's the truth. And when he got there, they arrested him. And my Uncle Bobby is redhead. He's a redhead. And I, we, there were some questions about, there's no children in here, right? Okay. There's some <laughs> questions about whether my Uncle Bobby was my father, my, my, my brother, or my um, uncle. I don't want to go into that. That's a Jerry Springer event for sure. <laughs> but the reason the cigar in the picture of Cuba is, I had a gentleman go to Cuba and he brought me a cigar back because he said, that of course, well, I'll never be able to go to Cuba because my last name is Helmy and they have our name there because of the mom and Bobby trying to kill Casper. Um, so I, he brought me a cigar. And my father always said that Cuban cigars are so good because they are rolled on the thighs of virgins. Don't ask me where he got that from. So I'm assured that that's the truth. <laughs> now, I just want to tell you all about Uncle Bobby. My Uncle Bobby, he really did hijack the plane, and when he got to Cuba, he knew that they wouldn't kill him because he was redheaded. And Cubans will not kill a redheaded person. So he really started acting strange while he was in prison. He would uh, howl at the moon, walk around on all fours. He cut his fingernails, threw them up in the air, and read whatever he thought they just meant on the, on the ground. And they finally was going to transfer him to Russia, and he escaped. No, he did not go to jail. This is my father drinking with his balls. And that's my father, and that's his cousin. That's all we say about that. <laughs> <laughs> because we really don't want to talk about that. <laughs> um, this is my daddy in his gangster outfit. He was kind of good looking, wasn't he? <laughs> he was bad, though. Um, these are some of the fish that you can catch diving off the coast of Savannah. This is hogfish. And you can't really tell, but those are a big old lobster. Uh, these are kids poking the eyes out of whiting. This is some of our fishing. That's Tommy, two Tommy Williams, Stephen, and Kevin Rose. This, every year the Coast Guard comes to my house. I have an inspected vessel. And they want to make sure that if you guys go on my boat, fall overboard, that I'll know how to get you back in the boat. So every year, the Coast Guard comes, and that's his, we named him Mr. Ruth Lee because it's Ruth Lee Company made him. And of course, you know he weighs 130 pounds dry and 180 pounds wet, and you know for a fact I can't pick that up. So the Coast Guard says, you have to ask for help. They throw it out, and they pick it up. You know, so if y'all fall out, we've got a big problem because I cannot pick you up. <laughs> so I've already uh, passed that. But he became the mannequin of the year. Uh, this is a moray eel. We catch them all the time. Yeah. What they do is they tie themselves in a knot, and that's how they get the hook out. Hmm. It's a purple back fiddler, best sheep's head bait ever. Oh. There's a purple back fiddler and a black back. And I know why the sheep's head like the purple back better because 
if you squeeze them and to taste the juice out of them, the purple back tastes better. That's a redneck way of doing things. Um, this is the flower that was come offshore. Drinking was involved. They got a big fish on. This guy is really having a party. This is the great white shark that I saw February the 20th. He was 11 foot long. We estimated he'd be about a thousand pounds. I had him on three times. We broke all kinds of records that day. One guy had him on twice, one guy had him on once. He was really big. That's me with a gag grouper. That's Deaver with a bunch of grouper. Some more grouper. Catch a lot of grouper. This is the grouper the day they caught a whole bunch of grouper. <coughs> we do a lot of jigging for grouper and we use the uh, butterfly jigs. That's Deidre, she never caught that grouper. She actually laughs at it, but you can't really see it. it the, the leaders are around the fish. Um, this is a window, of course. You <laughs> can't imagine why it's such a fish grabber, but I'm gonna tell you. This is my neighbor's window. Like this, and she was a busybody, my father used to say. And um, this, he, he called her busybody because he, she talked a lot about him leaving and coming in at all hours of the night making noise so when he found out that she was talking about him he started going to her door her window every time he came home whether it was three four or five and he'd blow the horn until she opened the window and said i know you're home so that's the busybody's lady's window <laughs> and my father said that and y'all might want to know this so y'all can identify busybody they wear big hats and i said why they do that he said they'll hide their big mouths <laughs> Um, this is my father's place on Montgomery Crossroads, and no, not Montgomery, wait a minute, that's Drayton, I think. <laughs> anyway, had several places. But this place right here is significant because um, the Savannah Electric Power Company, anybody here from there? <laughs> um, what they did was they came and told my father was going to charge him more for his electricity. And my father was the kind of guy who wasn't really pushed around, so he decided to make his own generator and run his own electricity. And he did, so he called the Savannah Electric Power Company and told him to get our, his, their poles off his property. In the back of the house, uh, in the back of his, let me see if I can show it to you. Right back here is where the ladies of the evening were, and he, he gave them free electricity, so you know. <laughs> Well, he did that. So he actually gave electricity to the whole block. And they did get their poles off of his property. Okay. That's my father. That's my father right there. His nickname is Moose. And I don't know if y'all remember Pete Hudson or not, but Pete Hudson, he didn't make it to He really looks like a gangster, doesn't he? He didn't make it too long. I think somebody killed him right off. This, this place is right next to where the courthouse is. It was right next to uh, Trailways bus station. Moose. Oh, I figured that in a minute. This, is, this was actually, this is inside the museum right now. They sent me a picture of it. So if y'all want to ever get your father, get your automobile repaired, dial 73259. I did that, nothing happened. So. <laughs> um, my father was a whiz when it came to automobiles. You know, I told him he built cars for Al Capone so that they wouldn't look like they were loaded. He also was, he could just listen to an engine and tell whether or not it, what was wrong if the ring was bent or, you know, anything. He was very, very smart. And as a result of him being so smart with automobiles, I kind of helped him a little bit when I was 14 or 15. I don't know if y'all know, uh, the old, back in the old days, the odometers, they just flipped over a little bit. And if you tried to mess with them and you didn't mess with them, you know what I'm talking about. Then. No, me? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, it's the truth. Anyway, what you do is, like an older car, 50s, 60s, if you look at it, the odometer is like little numbers in there. Well, if you tamper with those numbers, if you don't put it back right, they're crooked, right? At 14, I could turn it back and it wasn't crooked. <laughs> because my daddy said the car, he would always say, listen, 
how many miles you think is on that car? I said, 40. He said, it's showing 80. Turn it back. And I did. But I didn't know any better, so good news. They got all this electronic stuff now. This is a hot nose snapper. Oh, this is really where Daddy got good. This is a radiator. And my father devised a way to get radiators without taking them out of the car. And the reason he had to do that was because there were so many hunting accidents. When he'd get to his shop, there'd be and then also Cadillacs that had been, been at shootouts. So he figured a way, and this is one of the things I think is in the museum, because they asked me if he had a radiator today and was going to shoot up, and I told him no. So he could, he could actually fix the radiator without taking it out. So he was, uh, he had, in the back of his shop, they said he had a whole stack of radiators that he had practice on. So if you have a hunting accident, <laughs> I don't think I remember how to do it. Uh, this is some of the neat jellyfish that we have off our coast. They always say, how deep were you when you took that? I was in my, I just took that out of the picture of my, right out the window when it swam by. You can't see it, but there's like 10 broken back shrimp right hanging around it. Uh -oh. Okay, these are all the jellyfish. These are all the kinds of jellyfish that sting people on the 4th of July. I think they had 1,500 stings last year on the 4th. This is a jelly ball. Did you know that all jelly balls have a crab in them? That's a spider crab. Usually they're inside the but for some reason we notice they ride on the outside. And these are, he's riding on the outside. We don't know why he does this. There was the other one living inside. I think he might have outgrown his jelly balls, what I think. These are just some of the neat jellyfish that we have here. This is a man of war. It doesn't look very big because all of its tentacles are like 30 or 40 feet long and they're dragging the ocean floor. I've collected one for squished, that uh, jellyfish stuff, and I found out horribly because when I got it in the boat, then the tentacles came and it was, it was horrible. I got stung a few times. Thank goodness I wasn't allergic to them. Uh -oh. This is my mother. Um, she, she was killed in a car accident in 1930, no, she was 32 when she was killed in a car accident. These are the pictures I have of her taken in the cemetery. Now I guess that was the thing to do back in those days because that's all I have is pictures of her taken in the cemetery. Okay, back in the old, this is the, um, the but this is the Miss GG2 that I had in the 80s. And you really can't see it very well, but on the right hand side that's me with a bandana on, and it looks like I'm holding something. Well, I'm holding a gun. And the next thing I did is shoot the shark. So I don't know how somebody got that. They were behind me and when they took it, but I did shoot the shark. I was trying to get him to the boat. So I learned everything from my father. Be messing around at the dock. You know, I must be doing something wrong. Try the other hand. Okay, that's me. You notice my father dressed me so cute. I have on patent leather shoes. And so he did tell me, I think he dressed me real cute, patent leather shoes. This is after my father, I don't know if y'all remember Con and Company over on um, West Broad Street. It used to be a wholesale, wholesale place. And my father did, my father was colorblind. So he would just buy everything by the cases. So I had a case of those flannel shirts at the house. <laughs> and this is me at the Sheraton in the Savannah, which was originally called the Oglethorpe, which is a very interesting place for sure. Um, Al Capone stayed there. My father told me that Jim, Jimmy Hoffa was buried there. And then I got a great story from Holden about his grandparents. They made them leave on the night of their honeymoon because they were having to dig up a place to bury Jim and Hoffa. Daddy, he, they said he was buried in the ballroom. Daddy said he was buried under the helicopter pad. He also told me that in, um, in Savannah, uh, when you go to Las Vegas, you bury your dead in the desert. In Savannah, you're buried on the golf course at the Overthorpe. So, they had a big golf course that they buried all their dead. I, I don't know for facts, I just heard all these stories. But I always get excited when they do the 
the golf club, the golf course over. Um, my father bought me a lot of boats. Uh, this boat was bought, it's a wooden boat. I don't know how many times we almost sunk with wooden boats, but we did. These boats, you have to have water in them so they don't sink. Daddy bought this, somebody must have got a divorce and they needed to get the money quick. And I think Daddy cost a lot of it. Um, because he dated a lot. And this was another boat he bought as a result of a divorce. Does anybody recognize their boat? <laughs> it was probably your father's boat. And, but he only paid like $1,000 for it because the lady who wanted to sell it wanted to get back at her husband. The more, the grouper was so big he couldn't fit in the pitcher. This is what we eat sometimes. This is what we eat for breakfast. Let's be in a sausage and Coca-Cola. This is a blue spotted coronet, and it's not supposed to be here. We caught it. It is the most amazing fish. It has a bill like a duck and a long bill like a duck. It looks like a snake, and it's got the most wonderful blue spots on it. Of course, we let it go. I think a shark ate it. <laughs> I'm trying to get it to flip again. You tell me when I talk too much. I think, I think we're towards the end. Okay. <laughs> All right. Does anybody, okay. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Did any Fidel Castro take care of? Tell us about Fidel Castro eating here. Oh, this is pretty interesting. My father delivered his first car to Al Capone here or in at the DeSoto. No, of course, it wasn't this building. He delivered his first car here and he also ate lunch with Fidel Castro here, and uh, Daddy told me that Fidel Castro ate raw chicken. And I don't know, he couldn't come, he, but that is the truth. So, cool. Now, does anybody have any questions about um, anything about fishing? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>